Hi, I'm Zen Benefiel, and I'll be your guide today as we delve into the topic of telepathy. Now, you all know that telepathy is basically mind-to-mind -mind communication, right? Okay, my thoughts to your thoughts, your thoughts to my thoughts, or some derivative thereof, okay? Now, you might say, well, what gives you the authority to talk about this? I've had experience of it, believe it or not. Um, I think it's possible for everyone, and yet there are certain things that I was open to as a kid, and I'll uh, elaborate on those for just a bit, just to give you an idea. Um, first of all, when I was very young, um, I found out that I was adopted, and so I had some questions about that. I was about five years old, and uh, I was wondering, you know, where did I come from? Who was my real father? Um, I've been going to Sunday school, so I kind of prayed about it and hoped that I would hear something. Well, um, I suppose it was just a few months after my fifth birthday. I was uh, standing in front of the window at night, uh, looking out uh, across our front porch on the landing of a stairwell, and I heard this voice say, Hey, you! Now, I didn't really know where it came from, but I spun around and asked my mother if she had heard it, and she didn't. Um, so at that point, I kind of realized that there was something more going on. Didn't really talk about it a whole lot. A um, short time later, we were at church, and we walked, I was with my parents, we walked into the back of the sanctuary, and I thought, hi, that's all. And in that instant, it seemed like every head in the sanctuary turned and looked at me. Now, that was a little intimidating. Um, still, I didn't really think much about it. I don't know why. But as a kid, I guess you don't. You know, it's just one of those weird things. But then, uh, later on, when I was uh, in my first quarter in college... I had an experience. I was living in the honors dorm. I started in a pre-med program at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Uh, Dave Letterman, it's all water. Uh, at any rate, I was uh, walking in between the cafeteria and the dorm. I was on my way to eat lunch. And as I would walk by other students, I would hear this self-deprecating conversation and it would always start with you such and such so and so you know just a, a really uh, angry self-talk basically is what it was but because this was completely new to me and evidently my psyche had just been blown open uh, I thought it was all directed at me and so I uh, went back to my dorm room and didn't come out for several days. I didn't know what to do. And it wasn't until a good friend came over and we sat down and started talking about why he had to see me for a while. And I told him what was going on. And he said, well, you know, were those your or voice that you heard or was it other people's voices? And I had to acknowledge that it was others. It wasn't my voice. It wasn't that singular voice that I heard many years earlier. And then I realized, wow, um, I was hearing other people. Now, I didn't really know what to do about it, but just the fact that I became aware of it softened the voices. I, I was able to kind of minimize them. They didn't go away. However, I could work with them at that point. Now, because of our conversations, uh, we began wondering, hey, it, you know, if this is happening to me, he'd had similar experiences happen, but none to that degree. But we thought, you know, wow, is it possible that there might be others that are having these kinds of experiences, and if so, how might we um, find out and um, maybe talk?
talk to them or at least um, help each other with understanding what was going on. So within, oh, I'd say just a, a, maybe another couple of months, um, just in conversations with people that we met around campus, we didn't realize at the time you know, how connected people can be and, and that when you think about things, it often sets up what we might call a resonant frequency that begins to attract others that have a similar frequency or questions or experiences or, or things like that. It, it's really um, quite awesome, but as kids, you know, as teenagers, we didn't realize uh, what was happening. It, it just happened. So after a while, we began to uh, experiment with others. And, and so later on, we figured out that we could set things up. And how we found out was Gary and I, a friend of mine that asked me the questions, uh, we were having an evening in my dorm room. I lived in the honors dorm, fourth floor. And uh, my window, you could see the dorm on the other side of the street that was eight stories. My, uh, my room was on the fourth floor. And, uh, of course, it was the 70s, so, you know, we didn't have these kinds of experiences all the time. They usually happened when we were in an altered state. Um, I think that through research now, we understand that uh, various psychotropics do open the mind up and allow it to have particular freedoms that it may not have um, when we're in a normal waking state. Regardless, we found that this helped facilitate things. Well, this particular evening, he and I were in my room and we were communicating back and forth and, you know, listening to music. We had it up fairly loud and it was much easier to communicate telepathically than it was to open our mouths and compete with the volume. Um, when we would speak telepathically, it was at a completely different level and it was as though we were having normal conversation, even with the loudness of the music. So as we were talking, I kept hearing these girls giggling and making kind of, you know, comedic comments uh, about our conversation. And after a little while, I finally asked him, I said, do you hear them? And he said, no, I thought I'd been hearing somebody and I'm not quite sure who it is. And I said, I'm not either. But I've been looking out the window and I see some figures up in the room across the street and I'm just wondering if that's them. And as soon as I said this, I heard a girl's voice say, yeah, silly, we've been listening to you for a while now. And I thought, you know, I am not really believe in this. I don't know if I'm hearing you or not. Why don't you meet us outside? And let's prove that what we're hearing is actually you and you're hearing us and let's make it real. And so they said, okay. So this is middle winter at this point. So we bundled up and walked downstairs, went out in front of the dorm. And as we walked outside, I was attracted by some voices that were off to my right. Now the other dorm was straight in front of us. And we walked off to the side and there was a whole circle of people that were lobbing snowballs at each other without words. There was no verbal conversation going on, but there was conversation going on with each of the throws of the snowballs. Okay? It was like the person who was talking was throwing the snowball to a person that they wanted to respond and this kind of communication was taking place. Now, I don't know how long it was taking place before we arrived, but there was probably a dozen or so people and the girls had already become part of the circle. We recognized their voices and we talked with them afterwards. I mean, we did this for, oh, probably... 10, 12 minutes or maybe 15, I, I really don't know. But we got to the place where 
our excitement and, and inquisitiveness just got the better of us, and we had to create a verbal conversation. So we all got, to get, got together and talked about what our experience was and, and how we had found this out. And most of the stories were similar. They uh, had had an experience that initially kind of blew their minds, but then they realized that it was happening and um, somehow they met others who were having similar experiences and it made sense. Uh, and it didn't really freak them out because they were uh, available and willing to have the experience. Uh, and they thought that it was possible. So here we were having these experiences and, and um, most of them seemed haphazard. So we wanted to figure out a process that we could all use and experiment with it around campus to see if we could come up with anything that actually worked on a regular basis. So what we did is we began, you know, kind of questioning what seems to be the process, first of all. And this is what came out of it. It seemed like the most common experience was visualizing a person's face, looking into their eyes, and then sending a message. Now, this happened, of course, up close, but it was also good for distance communication. And how we found that out was we set up, um, I wouldn't call, necessarily call it a blind uh, or double blind study, but we set up experiments with others and we would send thoughts out, we would ask people to meet us at a certain time at a certain place and then go show up and see if they'd show up. And I would say at least eight times out of ten, it happened. As long as they were paying attention, we seem to have uh, the ability to communicate like this. So, what good is that? What, what possibly might that do to serve us now? Well, it helps us to recognize, first of all, that we do have that ability. Now, what we use it for is something that would have to be on an individual basis, I would think. Um, you know, there's stories that um, in the Philippines that the indigenous people use tele telepathy to um, stay hidden during the Second World War. So the following year, there was something that happened that really, uh, I, I think, was just... Um, a wonderful event, and yet it showed what else is possible, and it completely blew my mind. So the following year, I'm back at school. We are moving towards uh, winter quarter, and the friend of mine was supposed to show up for winter quarter, and he hadn't got back yet. And I kept calling his parents, wondering when he would, was going to be home. They weren't sure because they hadn't heard from him. He was at his grandfather's cabin um, a couple thousand miles north up into Canada. No uh, modern conveniences. He didn't have electricity, so he didn't have a phone or anything like that. And I got a little anxious, and so I thought, well, I'll just see if I can reach out. And I'd come home from a date one night. It was actually an early Saturday morning. And I laid down, I plugged the tape in, music always seems to help. And I uh, picked out a tape by a band called White Witch and a song called Help Me Lord. And just figured it might, you know, help. So I laid down, closed my eyes, imagined looking into his face, and then I uh, imagined grabbing him by the shoulders and standing him up so that I could see his entire body. I began a conversation with him as we were talking. His girlfriend from the year before, who was also one of our group, um, came into the conversation. So the three of us were in this um, space 
talking to each other and um, kind of wondering, you know, when he was going to be back. And uh, we talked with Caroline about what she was doing. And um, she said, you know, she was out uh, on the east or west coast and uh, probably wouldn't see us again. So, we, you know, I wasn't sure what was going on. I, I really didn't think about that at the time. Um, end of the song came, I came back, um, let things go, and the following Friday, I called him up, um, called his parents up actually to see if he was back. He answered the phone out of breath, so I'm kind of excited that he's back now. And I evidently knew it was me on the phone uh, and ran in to answer it because he just <laughs> returned. So I went over to pick him up and got him out of the car and the first thing I asked him was, hey, did you catch any flack last weekend? Uh, I wanted to set it up so that I didn't necessarily lead him into saying anything, but I wanted to be time specific. And he looks at me square in the eyes. He said, yeah, you son of a bitch, you woke me up out of bed. And I was like, what? So he said, yeah, I, I was laying there sound asleep. I felt somebody grab me by the shoulders, set me up in bed. I opened my eyes up. Your face was right in front of me. Carolyn's was right behind you. And we had a conversation. Um, conversation, you know, closed. <laughs> and I went back to bed. He said, frankly, I don't even remember what we talked about, but I remember you waking me up. So that kind of, of made us both realize that, hey, you know, um, we've got something here. Don't know about the repeatability of it, and frankly, we never tried at that point. However, there was another little um, indicator that took place uh, oh, probably a week and a half or so later. Um, Gary got a postcard, and it was a, a Krishna camp uh, postcard, and it had the addresses of, of various locations that were on the West Coast in California. And the one in Santa Barbara was circled. And the only other writing on the card beside his address was, enjoyed the conversation. And we both recognized Carolyn's handwriting. So here's something that we know is possible. And yet we don't necessarily know what the best use of it is yet. Heck, we're just finding out that these kinds of things are possible and they're not some kind of demonic possession or, you know, uh, something that's uh, built out to be some kind of re religious taboo. It's something that we actually have an ability to do that we're just realizing as we're evolving that we actually can do it. So, here's what I'd like you to do in order to set this up for yourself, okay? After all, this is what the objective is, is to teach you how to do this. And first of all, I guess you have to have some belief that it is possible, and then a process to actually uh, facilitate the whole thing, okay? So here's what you do. First of all, and you probably had somebody in mind already, or maybe a couple of bodies. Um, talk to them. You want to be able to at least acknowledge that you're going to be doing something and make them aware so that if they do happen to have something out of the norm happen, then they can be aware that this is potentially what it might be. And the reason we do that We've got so much going on, so much chatter in our heads, so many things that are distracting and disturbing our awareness uh, on a constant basis, it seems, that just to be aware or to have that thought introduced to us that something might be happening at least puts it into the thoughtmosphere that we carry with us so that when it does happen, that we may at least be able to acknowledge that something out of the norm just happened, okay? And become a little more attentive and aware at that point, all right? 
So the setup then is to uh, preferably know, have someone that you know well and that you're able to imagine their face and look into their eyes rather easily. Now you might even spend some time if you're willing and they're willing to actually sit in front of each other for a little bit and practice gazing into each other's eyes and just get comfortable with that so that you can uh, have that much more of a sense of each other. Don't know that it's necessary, but it certainly could help. Okay, So then, from there, you can set up time or not. Um, you know, if you're going to be doing this to really test if you're able to or not, it might be good not to have a specific time and then also to have a specific time so that you can figure out if it's indeed happening um, on, a, uh, on an on-demand basis. Okay, So, in this transmittal, you might want to have a very simple expression or thought or image or something that is not confusing and you know make it simple enough so that you get uh, the most bang for your buck <laughs> in that initial uh, attempt okay as you practice it you can probably develop to the, to the point where you can have entire conversations uh, now I would suggest keeping a journal, both of you. Um, oftentimes, your skills develop because you have that much more focus.